It's very comfortable to get caught up with our own uniqueness, and in fact, we enjoy reflecting it. But as Christians, that's not what we were created to reflect. Welcome to the Pax Christian Church podcast. We are so glad you've joined us today, and we pray that this message speaks to you and encourages you and challenges you to live for Jesus with everything that you have. Stick around after the message. We'd love to find out how we can connect with you and be praying for you. Here's this week's message from our Sunday gathering. I had an experience this week. Um, I, don't, I don't know how you guys feel about wearing overtly Christian clothing. Um, I know how I feel, so I'll talk about that. So um, I don't generally wear very overtly I'm a Christian kind of clothing. I, you know, like the faith shirts, the other things, for some reason, um, I, I wear those more. But things that are like Jesus loves you or, you know, something to that, or Jesus died for you or something very like overtly in your face, like I am obviously a Christian because I am wearing this shirt. I don't tend to wear those a lot. And I realized this week that that has a whole lot to do with me, not a whole lot to do with how I feel about Jesus. Um, Because I love Jesus and I love representing him in our community. Um, But I find that I feel very judged when I wear those types of things. Because in my head, people have a whole broad spectrum of opinions about Christians. And so I am representing something that's a little bit controversial as I'm walking through the grocery store. So Brian bought me a t-shirt that says, Jesus loves you on it. And it's gray and it's pretty plain, but except for this bold print right in the front center of the shirt. And I love to wear it, but I oh, I often wear it at home. <laughs> like on my day off when I'm puttering around the house. Well, I wore it yesterday and um, went for a bike ride with the kids. And I am riding my bike, right? Like who reads your shirt when you're riding a bike? But I'm riding my bike going, oh yeah, I got this shirt on. Oh yeah, I got this shirt on. Okay, like are people judging me? And then... And then I went, to, um, I went to the grocery store later, and I thought, oh, yeah, I've got this shirt on. Oh, man, people are going to be reading it. Like, okay, put on your smile. You get to represent Jesus today. And I did, and I, I had so much fun, just like, oh, yeah, you know what? I am a Christian, and you know what? I get to show people what being a Christian looks like, and they're going to know that the reason I'm smiling is because I got this Jesus loves you on my shirt because I'm I am a Christian I'm a Christ follower I represent Jesus wherever I go in our community whether it's on my shirt or not right it's very comfortable to be a Christian in our country it's very comfortable we have the freedom to be Christians in our country and that's wonderful It can be very comfortable, though, because we don't have to talk about it. And if we don't want to engage it, we don't have to. We can be private about our faith. It's very easy to get comfortable and be private about our faith and not make a stand that we are part of God's people. It can be very simple. And it can be really hard to identify as a Christian in our culture, because honestly, it's not very popular. It might be allowed, but it's not very popular to identify as a Christian or identify as a Christ follower or as one of the people of God in our culture. It's really easy and normal for people to identify as a whole lot of things. You guys know, we hear about it all the time, including simple things like introvert, extrovert, outgoing, shy, type A personality, type B personality, creative, planner, nerd, geek, athletic. Like we, are, we claim those things. We own them, man, all those things about us. We own all of those things, but very rarely do you hear someone say, oh yeah, I'm a follower of Jesus. That's how I identify as a Christian. It's very comfortable to get caught up with our own uniqueness uniqueness and in fact we enjoy reflecting it but as christians that's not what we were created to reflect we were created to reflect the image of god and we were created to shine the light of christ 
in our communities. Matthew 16, 24, it tells us that Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Christ calls us and those who love him to deny themselves and follow him, to focus more on his kingdom and the things of his word and his character and who he is than on who we are and how we identify ourselves. He calls us to deny our creature comforts, our physical comforts, our titles, and to follow him. And this morning, we're going to dive into the life of Moses. We're going to pick up Hebrews again in Hebrews 11. And we're going to talk about a time in Moses' life when he did just that. When he forsook the title and denied all of the creature comforts that went along with it and aligned himself with God's people and with God as his God. So we're going to go into uh, the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. If you'd like to turn to, to it in your Bibles, you are welcome to do that. We're going to be starting in verse 24. It'll be up on the screens, and it's also in the Bible app, if you want to follow along in the Life Church Bible app. It's there. Or the YouVersion Bible app. That's where it is. Not the, I don't know what the Life Church Bible app is. Okay, here we go. Just checking to see if you're still with me, guys. Hebrews 11, 24. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as greater value than the treasure, treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. Would you pray with me this morning? Father God, thank you so much for your word. Father, we believe that your word is inspired by your Holy Spirit, that it is youth, useful in teaching and rebuking and correcting, and that, Lord, it is alive and speaks to us still today. Father, I pray that you would open our hearts to your word this morning, to the truth of who you are and what you call us to do. May our eyes and our ears and our hearts be open to see and hear and listen and in doing so obey your word. Jesus, in your name we pray these things. Amen. All right, so let's, we're going to take this a piece at a time and we're going to go back into the book of Exodus and look a little bit of the life of Moses as we go through this. Okay, so by faith, Moses, when he had grown up, he refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Now last week, Pastor Brian talked about Moses' parents putting him in the Nile and Pharaoh's daughter finding him. And this was at a time of great um, persecution of the Hebrew people in Egypt. So Pharaoh had made a decree that all of the firstborn boys would be killed. Um, the, the midwives at that time that were ordered to kill the babies said, oh, they're born before we get there. We can't do it because they feared God and God blessed them. And then God decrees an order that all of the firstborn sons should be killed. Pharaoh, sorry, not God. Who's, who's with me? I'm t I, that was a test. Pharaoh decrees that. God actually decrees that in a different way about Egypt later. And we're going to talk about that next week. This week, we're going to pick up the story where it says that one day after Moses had grown up, he went out. Oh, sorry. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. So if you turn with me to Exodus 2, starting in verse 11, we're going to just talk about the life of Moses a little bit this morning. One day, verse 11, after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them hard at their labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Okay, it says his own people twice. Already we see that Moses is identifying with the people of God more than he's identifying with the family that he has grown up with in Egypt. He's been adopted as the Pharaoh's daughter, the grandson of the Pharaoh. That comes with title. That comes with, um, that comes with sort of an 
I can't think of the word that comes with an inheritance, thank you, that comes with an inheritance, that comes with a lot of creature comforts, that comes with a very nice, cushy life. And yet, he's choosing to go out to his own people who it's identifying. These are his own people. He's going out to his own people. He's being drawn to them. He is choosing them already. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Verse 12, looking this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. And while murder is still a sin, what we see here is Moses is making, it's like a line has been drawn in the sand. And he's making a choice to stand with the people who are being oppressed, who are being held down, who are being mistreated. He's standing with them. He's choosing to defend their cause. He is aligning himself with the people of God. He's making that choice right here. He's concerned about the state of his people. It bothers him what's happening, so much so that he acts to defend them on their behalf. His heart is for them, and he is aligning himself with the people of God. He's making that choice. It says in verse 13, the next day he went out and he saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, who made you ruler and judge? That's kind of funny. Judge over us. Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. And when Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. So Moses chooses to defend the people of God. He chooses to stand for them. And he has come to a point in his life where there is no turning back. He has chosen to align himself with the people of God, with God, the God of his ancestors. And there is no turning back based on what he did. He just gave it all away for this people. He gave it all up. He has he has lost all claim to Egypt, all inheritance, all stature, all title. Everything is now gone, and he's made that choice. And ultimately, he's given up their amenities, their wealth, and all that it had to offer him. And because he does this, his willingness to do this, his willingness to give it all up and follow God and, and be a part of God's people, ultimately, it allows him to play one of the most important roles in the history of Israel. God will use him to deliver Israel from Egypt because, because he's made this decision. He's come out of Egypt and he's putting God first. He's choosing to put God first. He denies himself all the creature comforts of the Egyptian lifestyle and there's no turning back. There's no turning back now for Moses. One commentator said it this way, self-denial is not just saying no to outward actions, but it is a mortification, a dying, a death of the desires and affections of the mind that wants to place value on the things in this life, especially the things of this world that oppose spiritual things. Moses crucified his heart to his outward enjoyments thinking of them as rubbish in comparison to Christ. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. And really, as we read this, we see sort of a prophetic foretelling of what Christ would do, of what Christ would do when the King of Heaven chose to give up heaven for a time and come to earth as a man and be mistreated on our behalf so that we can know God. And so we see that looking back on this side of the cross as we look back at the life of Moses, we can see the parallel in his life in what God was doing to what Jesus does for us when he comes. Paul tells us, Strong's is a good, is a good resource. You guys should all use it, I love it. Um, <laughs> 
Jesus came to earth. Wait, I'm sorry. Okay, so Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 8, uh, chapter 8, verse 9, he says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich, so that you through what he sacrificed, through what he gave up, through what he denied himself, you have an inheritance in heaven. You have been given eternal life. You have been given forgiveness of all of the sins that you have ever committed, all of the things that you have done wrong, forgiveness for that has been made available to you through what Christ did for us. And he did this so that you would inherit the kingdom of God. He adopted us. God has adopted us as sons and daughters. He has changed our identity. When you accept what Christ did for you on the cross, your identity has been changed. How you identify with this world, with the things of this world, with the things of this life should be fundamentally different when you become a Christian because we are no, our allegiance is no longer to this world and the things that bring happiness for a short time, but our allegiance is to God and his kingdom and what's coming. And what's coming because of what he did for us on the cross. Hebrews eleven twenty six says that Moses, he regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. You have to wonder what was so compelling about aligning himself with the people of God, that he was willing to forsake all else, that he was willing to deny himself all of those creature comforts and pleasures. Here's the thing, Moses knew who he was. He was the son of a Levite. His sister was part of his childhood. It's what it said to us last week. His mother got to nurse him until he was three years old. Moses knew who he was. It says he went out with his own people. He knows he's going out to his people, the Hebrews. And the God of the Hebrews is the God of his ancestors. He knows who he is. And he believes that that God has more to offer him than all that Pharaoh's court could ever offer him. And today we have that same hope that when we approach God, he has more to offer us than anything in this world can offer us, than any creature comfort, than anything we could strive to earn or make or do in our own might or in our own way. God has something better for us because everything in this world is fleeting. It will not last. It may last maybe for a lifetime if you're lucky. But our destination as the people of God is not this earth, it is the kingdom of heaven and eternity with God. God says, seek first my kingdom and all of these other things will be added unto you. Our striving for these creature comforts, all of these things that we spend all of our time on, all of our energy, all of our worry and our anxiety and our fears. And when we look at our world and we see the things that are wrong and we spend so much energy trying to figure out how we make it better. I know people who identify more with their personal exercise plan than they do with Christ. I know people who identify more with Star Trek than they do with Christ. I know people who know more movie quotes than scripture that are Christians that have been Christians a long time. And the thing I know about them is what movies they like. The things I don't know about them is how has God changed their lives? God has more to offer us. So much more to offer us than the two and a half hours of joy we spend in the movie theater. He has so much more to offer us than all of the striving and the toil and the work of our hands produces in this earth. He has so much more freedom. He has so much more hope. He has so much more joy for our lives. And Moses was willing to give it all up, to deny himself, to be counted as a slave. I mean, think about what he was choosing. Royalty or slavery? There has to be something about our God 
that is so compelling that would make him choose that? Do you believe that? That there is something so compelling about our God that it is worth your whole life? I do. Moses did. In faith, he forsook all of that. And because he did, God used Moses to prove his greatness and his goodness through his people to all of Egypt. And we're going to talk about that part tomorrow. But the point I want to make about that is that that has always been a call for Israel, for the people of God, to be a light to the nations. And not a light like a bright light when you're lost in the darkness, but kind of but a light that shows the glory and the greatness of God to our entire world. God chose Israel, he set them apart, and he said, you will be a light to all nations. You will be a light to all nations so that they know that you're not cool, but he is cool. That was the purpose. So that all of these surrounding nations who worshiped other gods, who were lost, who were wandering, who strove in their own might, would look at what God was doing in Israel and say, I want to follow that God. He must be great. He must be mighty. Look at what he is doing. They were meant to be a light. And Moses became part of that. And he got to show the entire world at that time, all of Egypt, the might and the power and the glory of God. He got to be part of that. Jesus was born on a dark night. And when he was born, a light appeared in the sky, the star of of David, guiding people to him. To Jesus. And Jesus has called us to be lights. In Matthew 5, 16, he says, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. That is our witness. We We are meant to be the light of Christ in this world. Christ came, he lived, he died for us, he rose again. He sits at the right hand of the Father, making all things new. And he calls us to continue the work he began on earth, to continue being the light of God in this world, shining as lights to all nations, to all the world, to our community, to our friends, to our family, to our loved ones, to complete strangers in the grocery store that read my Jesus loves you shirt. (laughs) He's called us to be that light, to deny ourselves and put him first. And put him first so that all the world would know how great and mighty and powerful and loving and compassionate and slow to anger and forgiving our God is. That's what we're meant to be doing. It's what Moses chose to do. And it's what Jesus has asked us to do. Philippians 3, 4 through 11 Paul says, though I myself have reasons for such confidence, if someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh and what we can do in our own abilities, he says, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness, based on the law, faultless. Paul was legit. He could do it all. And that's what he's saying. He was more than capable of what he was doing. And he counts it all as loss, but for the case of Christ. He sets it all aside. All of those qualifications, all of the title, all of the the things that he can do and make happen in his own right according to his own will and his own intentions. Paul sets that all aside. He says, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. Whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ as my Lord for, for whose sake. Christ's sake, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ 
and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. That's all it takes. Not our own might, not our own power, just believing. Believing in Jesus and what he did for us and accepting it faith to follow him and forsake all else. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participate in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Attaining to the resurrection of the dead, because the great paradox of Christianity is that if you want to gain your life, you must lose it. Give it all to Jesus. It means putting aside our selfish, selfish interests for God's interests. Trusting that where we are weak, he is strong. It's putting aside all of our titles, all of the things that we cling to, all of the things we say we are, the identity that we think makes us us. That introvert, extrovert, outgoing, shy, planner, creative, sporty, academic, trucky, Star Wars or I don't know. Some of you guys, some of you guys know what I'm talking about though. DC Marvel. All of those things that we align ourselves with. God wants our full allegiance. He has already changed our identity. We just have to own it. We have to choose it. And to choose it, we have to deny ourselves pick up our cross, and follow him. That's what he's called us to do. Moses did it. Jesus did it. And he's calling us to do it. And when we do it, instead of reflecting ourselves to the world, we get to shine the light of Jesus and reflect him in our world. And I don't know about you guys, I'm not perfect. My love is not perfect. My judgment is not perfect. It really has no place. My opinions are not perfect. You know who is perfect is Jesus. And the moment we start trying to reflect him and represent him is the moment we start to experience the fullness just a little bit of what he has for us in the life to come. That's what we're shooting for. I don't know about you, but I want to take as many people with us as we can. Jesus, before he left this earth, he sent his disciples out to perform miracles. He blessed them, he anointed them, he prayed with them. And through the power of his spirit, they healed people. They cast out demons. And then he sent more. We forget sometimes, but then he sent sent 72 out after that. His intention was never that the disciples would come in, hear his teaching, and keep it to themselves. He's trusting us all with what he's done for this earth. You've been given the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Will you open the door for others? Thanks for listening today. We hope this blessed you and that God spoke to you. We'd like to connect with you. You can find us at paxchristian.church and fill out the digital connect card. Or find us on social media as Pax Christian Church on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. If this message spoke to you today, would you consider sharing this message with someone? Maybe tell a neighbor or a friend. Maybe leave a review and let others know what this has done for you. May you be inspired and transformed by God's Spirit as you step out into this world to declare that there is peace with God for everybody through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ.